good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second series in the Alliance series. We have with us today, Mr. Omer Rafiq, who is the Director of Operations at Royal Fan. Before we pass on the floor to Mr. Omer, we would like to spend some time to talk about ADR, about the ADR initiative and the Alliance series itself. The Alliance series was started to allow the different players, the different friends, the different allies that we have in this dispute resolution field to come together for peace. The ADR initiative was started in Pakistan so that we could begin the peaceful evolution of bringing dispute resolution out of the dark and making it sustainable for the world at large. We have trained, we have offered services, and now we are starting this Alliance series to bring all our friends together to share with us what they think about the state of the affairs currently existing in Pakistan and in the world at large. For now, it is evident that with COVID-19, everything is shifting in the world and global landscape. Things do not seem to operate in the same capacity as they used to before and may never do so again. So there is a new normal that we have to get used to. And we are trying to see if there is anything that ADR can do to help achieve this new normal. With that said, I would like to pass on the floor to Mr. Omer Rafiq. He is one of the pioneers in his field, in his profession. He is taking on a legacy of years and years of brilliant hard work. Royal Fans and Rafiq Engineering itself is the pioneer of home appliances. They're one of the largest manufacturers of fans in Pakistan. And they host a factory in Gujarat, which hosts, I'm sure, innumerable complications that we hope we can help him address. So please, Mr. Omer, could we have you on the floor? And could you please tell us how business is doing these days in times of COVID-19? Thank you, Akbar. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to this uh, series and this webinar. Um, obviously, COVID-19 has affected businesses negatively. And uh, for us, since we are mostly dealing in the local market, we do have exports but most of our sales, a lot of it actually is in the local market. So we weren't as affected. Um, still, we're a manufacturing business and uh, manufacturing, uh, even if it uh, is you know, stopped for a week or a month, then the impact is huge because you have a lot of overheads, you have a lot of um, uh, labor costs and you have a lot of costs which you have to cover. So. In that sense, obviously, uh, we had to shut down our plant for a month. There were no sales. And since we're a seasonal business, uh, most of our profits are made in like five or six months in the summer season when the uh, sale of fans or um, you know, related appliances is going on in the market. So it, COVID impacted us in peak summers. So obviously, it did impact us uh, in a huge way but not as badly as <clears throat> some of the other businesses who were mostly catering to the export market, like sporting goods, like surgical instruments, which are mostly based in Salcourt. A lot of textile units had to go through major, uh, you know, downsizing and um, they basically lost all of their orders uh, just within a few days. So we're, you know, in these times, we're thankful that we're still staying afloat. We didn't have to let go of our employees and, uh, Things are, I mean, things are okay, given the circumstances. Um, future plans obviously are affected negatively um, because we obviously have a lot of plans about, you know, future uh, expansion. And uh, then, you know, because of the negative impacts on profits, on the revenue streams, we have to sort of, um, you know, change all of that. And uh, there's a quote, I don't know if, that, if it's true or not, but someone shared a quote of Alibaba, the Alibaba founder Jack Ma on WhatsApp, that if this year, uh, if you're making even, then you should think that you're making a profit. So I think that's the mindset going forward. That if you're breaking even, then it's good. But obviously, I mean, uh, it's, you know, it's a very uh, negative impact <clears throat> for us and generally on manufacturing businesses, businesses all over. 
yeah. Thank you for that, Omar. So before I actually dive into some of the points you've raised, tell me, how much do you know about ADR itself? To be quite honest, I'm not very well versed about what ADR is. I know basics. Uh, I don't know the details on how it works. Um, but from my uh, you know perspective, I think ADR is happening uh, in Pakistan very regularly because pe people don't really trust the court systems. And if you uh, do, you know, uh, if something, if a dispute goes to the legal side of things and you can expect that it's not going to get resolved you know it'll keep on getting delayed and it's sort of a delay tactic to uh, pursue your dispute in the legal system but people have other sorts of uh, methods uh, through which they pursue dispute resolution it's not in a legal framework or maybe an official framework but there is like you know adr going on uh, in different forms and methods that that is beautiful. So basically, ADR is happening. It's just not happening in, let's say, an official capacity, right? Or maybe even in a professional capacity or structured capacity. So maybe exactly. the way you are practicing, I'm assuming you by ADR, you're going with mediation, right? Or even yes. negotiation for that matter. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I'm, uh, I'll give you an example. So if I uh, have a dispute with one of my customers, uh, the last thing I do, I would do is pursue the matter legally. So what I would do is I'd approach him, you know, I'd go to one of his uh, union or, you know, alliance leaders. So my association is uh, PEF Magad, Pakistan Electric Fan Manufacturers Association. So similarly, many uh, of my customers are members of associations. So I'll go to them, I'll go to one of their leaders and say, you know, this is my issue. Could you please intervene and mediate on my behalf? And then they'll, you know, uh, they'll get involved and they'll try to resolve the matter. But the difference is that these methods don't really have, uh, you know, legitimacy. They can't really rule on someone's behalf. They can try to mediate, but if things aren't progressing, they can't really intervene. So while it is uh, effective in the sense that there is this social stigma, people do want to, you know, resolve their differences and if someone is on the wrong if someone so for in my case if one of my customers isn't paying me uh, some of the time if i go to you know if i go, go to the or do these things go to their associations they will sort of you know uh, come in line but most of the time it doesn't work but even then i won't pursue the matter legally because i feel that going to the courts will be a bigger challenge for me uh, i mean i won't get any results at the end of the day and it'll be a lot of uh, waste on my like finances my time so uh, i think you have a really good value proposition here if you can maybe bring uh, adr some legitimacy or maybe you have some power to rule on someone's behalf or you can implement the decisions uh, then i think you do have a, a huge potential here Okay, so I've heard some very interesting words as far as implementation is concerned, and as far as let's say whatever has been operating right now, which may not be legitimate or uh, very structured. Let's go with that, right? So what I'm thinking of is maybe there is a way to introduce certain structure, certain training, certain things that we've been doing globally to I don't know if PEF myself would be interested, but we could figure it out with them. If there are people who are mediating, then I think I mentioned, or if I haven't been clear, I would very much like our role as the ADR initiative not to be felt as encroachers into someone else's territory. We would rather be enablers. We would rather go in and allow someone, okay, this is something that you're doing. We have extensive research, extensive course, extensive material that will allow you to do this better, maybe. And that could be the starting point of how we first try to implement what you may call legitimacy or structure into these uh, already existing models that you have, right? So if you do have a customer, and even before that, let's assume, like we mentioned labor, we mentioned uh, that CR code has export issues and innumerable other things, right? So in Corona right now, the problem that we're definitely facing is that 
uh, it's amazingly difficult to interpret contract because you don't know what contractual provision is going to apply right now in the pandemic situation because you don't have a certain idea whether it's force majeure, whether it's whether it's just a breach, whether it's just nothing. So in that sense, you have the options of either going to court, but in a strange cash, the courts are closed. So what do you do? You have to sit down and you have to talk about it, right? So the, the thing that I see right now is that in your industry alone, you are do, dealing with a lot of uh, labor issues, a lot of other complications that are arising because Corona has come about and there needs to be a conversation about what or how you can move on from this or move on with your customers, with your resellers, with your distributors, how they can actually figure it out with your work it out with you. Maybe the existing contractual provisions, right? So in that sense, that would be mediation as a service. But long before that, I think that we could also work with you on training as well. Now, the implementation part, now that is, that's complicated because in the simple sense, you, when you try to reach out to PASMA or to any of your associations to uh, not only mediate, but to try to, um, how do I put this, not coerce, but enforce whatever settlement you had to get into, you chose still not to go about the legal way, which would be submitting a settlement or something in court and asking them to enforce this because this is what this guy signed because you don't really want the court at all, which works perfectly in your scenario, considering you have the experience of not thinking the court will be able to give you any sustainable result. Now, I would very much like to sit and talk about this deeper about this implementation because implementation is turning out to be a bigger problem. A lot of people that I've spoken to, and maybe uh, there was this, uh, conversation we had with the senior uh, retired chief justice where he said that the, if you try to take ADR, which is mediation for now let's say, and not arbitration, not negotiation, let's just stick to mediation for now, and you get a settlement and you're very happy that you've done everything outside court but to enforce that settlement you don't have to go to court where exactly have you saved your client, whatever, yes you've saved him a certain amount of time but not the entire hassle of not having to go to court. So he suggested that there needs to be certain way of implementation, the same way that you mentioned through your associations maybe. There can be mechanism that we can develop with you on how to actually make sure that the settlement that someone signs, first of all, it be something that is in the best interest of all parties, so there's not that much of a need to force someone to live up to it. See, the, the danger of a bad settlement, if there is such a thing, is the fact that you're constantly worried that the other person would back out from it. But if you have done, if I would ever a, do a good mediation, in the mediation where you know where both parties stand, and what both parties have agreed to and why they've agreed to it, because they've agreed to it knowing that this is their way forward and this is better than any other option that they have. The reason someone is going to back out from that settlement could be that he has changed his mind for some reason. That mm -hmm. may be because of um, some ulterior motive, but could be because of a change of situation which would require further conversation. But usually, uh, a good settlement, a good way to come to an agreement requires minimal implementation, yet when necessary, and of course, the human psyche may at times tend to be very fluid with this, you need to have certain mechanisms in place that can allow you to try to implement a settlement that you've had, right? And we need to develop some things that are not related to courts on this. So what are your thoughts on that? That really got me started now. I think your legitimacy uh, basically depends on being able to f enforce a decision. So right now the ADR which is going on, um, 
basically you know similar to what you are proposing right but right. it has no legitimacy. so uh, at the end of the day if a dispute is settled so if i settle it through the traditional way which is going on right now i know that it's not really enforceable by either you know the party or even the forum which i'm going to and so any association or any you know group of people who try to mediate won't have any uh, legal jurisdiction or they won't basically be able to enforce the decision so i think you all uh, that it's a good value proposition because i know there are a lot of uh, businesses in fact most businesses who want to avoid going to courts because that is the right. last thing as a business you know if there's a yeah. dispute try to settle it out of courts but then again if i'm not getting a decision which is enforceable and you know people back out for all sorts of reasons so most of the most of the time one of the you know uh, side is being unreasonable so if someone's being unreasonable how do you uh, you know how do you go about that so it has to be enforceable so uh, i think if your legitimacy or your value proposition is just based upon being able to enforce it otherwise there are other forms of adr which is going on right now so you know in order to uh, for you to sort of capture the market uh, because mm-hmm. i'm thinking you'll have to offer <laughs> some sort of legitimacy because you're going to come in and say you know we have these credentials and we can you know mediate and ensure that your dispute is resolved out of courts right so on enforcement and implementation i feel like uh, we will have to then basically design two separate models one would be the old classical model of enforcement where if mm-hmm. there is a settlement that adr initiative has been involved in we will work with our clients in some capacity to try to enforce it or to assist them which which is something that we will have to work on or think about considering it may conflict with our neutrality so there is a standard option that we can also help any of our clients enforce a decision which the other client or the other um, sorry the other uh, party has backed out from right but side by side we should definitely start developing and thinking on implementation mechanisms that don't require the courts at all so how those happen are something that i think the i would like our research wing to start working on it would require a maybe future conversations with you and with some other people all over the industry we need we will need lots sorry, of ideas i do cut you off but how does this happen in like other uh, more like developed countries where uh, adr is going on how do they okay. uh, pull the decisions so it's very simple in uh, let's say some uh, somewhere like i think it was italy that started the first one i could be greek i could be wrong so basically a settled agreement by a mediator is enforceable because it is once you submit it in a court it becomes a court's decree so in jurisdictions like ours where if once you've gotten an a judgment by the court then it goes into execution basically so there are two separate processes there is the trial itself and then there is execution of whatever decree has happened so the uk as well have been and here i'm not entirely sure if we have succeeded over there as well but have been sorting with the idea of using these media to settlement because i'll tell you this much uh if you try to file a case in the uk the courts will ask you have you considered adr and if you have not they will recommend that you do it and if you refuse to do it you have to give reasons because later on in the actual judgment itself uh an unreasonable refusal to use adr Uh, implies cost sanctions so they will sanction you with cost or with something else to at least make you consider it in the long run now there in fact in canada there was a very interesting uh, system i'm not entirely sure which province i remember you're from canada as well you're from toronto right you did it from university of toronto i think it was somewhere on the northwest side never mind so what they had was that for, there were three layers of uh processes which may be called adr before you were allowed to file something in court you had to get your first when you submit something in court it is mediated on by a general someone like a lawyer maybe then it is uh 
then if that fails, it is mediated on, or let's say someone then tells the other party in the next step that there is a, something called an evaluation. The lawyer or some legal profession will tell the party that your case is weak, for example, and this may happen when you go to court. So it's probably best for you to settle. If the party still refuses for whatever reason, then a judge of that court, the same court where he's applying, not the same one who is going to be hearing the case, is also going to evaluate the entire thing and tell the party that this is a weak case, don't go for it. And this is still within the system. But what happens is, in a lot of these, uh, from so Turkey implemented a, a mediation uh, statute, I believe, for specifically for label disputes as well. What happens is a lot of these settlements, when they become decrees of court, you pass the first hurdle, so to speak. You pass the trial phase, so you're only in the execution phase, which is still a headache, let's say, but it's not as bad as, let's say, going through the entire trial again. So when, a mediated settlement gives you, right? sorry? So you said that uh, this, uh, this becomes a decree of the court, but then this could be appealed in the court, right? So if someone doesn't like the decision, they could appeal against it. And it sort of starts the whole procedure again. See, that has very limited ground. It's mm -hmm. similar to what we try in Pakistan. Unfortunately, it's an open minefield. But usually in most other countries, it's similar to an arbitration award, or it's at least considered that way. So you cannot open an arbitration trial or an arbitration proceeding in a court. You can only decide on whether this award has been passed legally or not legally, and then continue with that, right? So okay. the thing with the mediation is it is completely confidential. So if I have mediated on any case, I cannot be called upon as a witness in a court to say what was said here, was he right, was the other party right, did they give any evidence? I cannot speak about the mediation in a court. Similarly, the parties involved in it, because you have to make mediation attractive, they, uh, they sign something which can be called a confidentiality agreement or a mediation agreement. In that, there are certain legal pr uh, provisions we use, which is called without prejudice which basically means that anything, any evidence that you submit during the mediation proceeding will never be submitted in court. That evidence will not be considered by the court at all. So the courts have do not, in the mediation itself, they don't have the power to actually unravel the mediation and see what's going on. So you cannot appeal it that way. You can only say that this mediation was, for example, maybe there was coercion involved, there was duress, someone was forced to sign or something. That is a very different issue of itself but the actual crux of the dispute you cannot really appeal in it unless you just completely set aside and do a completely new thing okay okay so that's um that those are still legal things that we're working on in pakistan as well they've taken we made some we made an act we've got some rules as well but mm -hmm. our general inclination is not to rely on the government or wait for the government to implement a law or legislation or something, because that is a that's a much much longer walk then. So yeah. Now where were we? You're the one who's hosting. <laughs> that is true. So we have gone through implementation. We have gone through enforcement we yeah. have gone through the possibility that your existing setup of how mediations may happen requires some structure some credibility i think we should be working on all three of these things a seeing how the existing structures work how whether we can help them with some credibility and then also develop some mechanisms or some support for how a settled agreement or any agreement that comes through ADR should be enforceable or should be capable of being implemented, right? Yeah. I so, think, uh, again, um, because this is a very, uh, I mean, you have a good 
value proposition because a lot of people uh, want to avoid going to courts. So, um, you know, we can work on all those things, but I think the crux for you would be implementation. So the reason I keep on uh, highlighting it because um, that's as a business owner, that's the thing I, uh, you know, uh, deal with or I struggle with. So why don't we just take one case or, uh, you know, do it case by case or go ahead yeah. and uh, maybe start struggle, uh, maybe sorry, study my disputes with my vendors or my customers and see on how you can, you know, help us out with that. Or uh, I think that we can start by doing that, yeah. Yeah, that could be good. We could start a little pilot project and then we could just build on that. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. And that has been a very fruitful discussion with you, Omer. We have a few questions now from the audience. Do you want to go into them for a bit? Sure. These, well, they seem to be very legal, but let's start with the one that seems less legal. If a party involves a mediator and results in successful mediation, hence an agreement, is there any way to get enforced in the court of law in Pakistan if there's a dispute in the future? Or is our system not that developed yet? So I would, that seems like something that maybe is more catered towards the law of Pakistan and we just discussed it a little. So in a certain sense, if your, if your agreement is brought before a court, we have developed in, at least in Punjab, there are uh, area centers where judges sit to mediate cases as well. So there are certain types of cases that must be mediated. So there are specific judges assigned for those mediations. Uh, if there is a settlement made within that court and that does become the decree of the court and that can be enforced. But whether an external mediator can have his decree enforced in court, I don't think we have that system as yet. We do not have the system developed as yet for someone else to come in and say, this is my decree, this is equal to anything else, so please have this enforced. But I will have to check up on this again. This is a very shifting landscape. We've just come out with the act and the rules, and there needs to be an interpretation of those acts and rules for us to be clear about this, because that act does allow for accredited mediators and centers to be established. But since that hasn't been implemented as yet, and there are certain questions about whether they, it can be implemented, there's some, there's some complications with that act and rules. So this is an open question and it still needs an answer as yet. So we'll be able to do this in maybe a short while afterwards. Beyond that, I, there's another very legal question. Would ARB, med ARB be a viable form of enforcement in Pakistan? Omar, do you know what ARB, med ARB is? I'm sorry, you're breaking up. Could you repeat? Do you know what ARB, med ARB is? I have no idea. Okay. You know what an arbitration is? Yeah. Okay. So, actually, this has happened more internationally. When you start an arbitration, you're part of an arbitration statute in most jurisdictions. So in Pakistan, you could be under the Arbitration Act of 1940. What happens is, if the arbitrator recommends you to try mediation, and you try it and you come back to the arbitrator with a settlement, the arbitrator can then convert that into an award. So then technically, it becomes an arbitration award, the mediated settlement. That can then be enforced in court using the same laws and same act that we've used. So that is a uh, that is a loophole that we exploit until mediation in itself is allowed to work without an arbitration award. So that yeah. is actually one option that we can use. But that said, then I again, think it, should... the award is then you know it's become a part of the legal system, right? Then you can appeal Undoubtedly. against the whole circle. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that that's circle is. I I think that's the sort of thing business owners or generally people want to avoid. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, I don't know the legal the legal jargon behind all of it, so um, 
you I don't know how enforceable it is or once uh, an award is enforced if you appeal against it what are the chances of you being successful in your appeal but uh, it's a very tricky thing because you have to make it enforceable but then you have to avoid the courts uh, so for you it's a big challenge I, I don't know how to you know how you would go about it but it's a big challenge for you say the answer that I would give to that would maybe be that we need to <laughs> and this is going to sound like social justice uh, that we would probably need to have some external way of imposing sanctions on the person who has let's say breached a mediated agreement right that imposition of sanctions if it comes from us i mean that would be impossible for us to withstand the amount of negativity we'd face but if we try to see there could be the possibility that if the mediation happens under your association then maybe mm-hmm. your association can somehow i don't know shame him or make him realize that his entire reputation is on the line because the settlement that he has breached is going to be maybe part of some black mark on his ledger or something it could uh, um it could be a lot of things yeah, uh, a lot of those a lot of those things would involve other people realizing that this is a problem that needs to be solved because yeah. if your association realizes that having their members not breach a settlement that happens within their premises or within their uh, ambit would be good for them and in fact would place greater trust in them and uh, at the end of the day you don't have to literally give him a damages award you just have to make the breaching party realize that if they breach the agreement then mm-hmm. everyone else will be aware of it and they will be just as wary of doing any business with them so how much idea. that's a good idea uh, it could be implemented okay and- i have uh, we actually were discussing uh, so i was a part of uh, the executive committee of petma last year and one of our members did bring this up he was like you know you should uh, blacklist vendors who are uh, or customers who do you know uh, cheat the factory owners or even vendors who uh, you know are uh, like we should make some sort of blacklist so having right. a third party come in and managing mm-hmm. blacklist gives a uh, sort of legitimacy to the process because the fact the pefma uh, executive member and the uh, you know chairman vice chairman they're all factory owners so it's not completely it's sort of biased you know it's not unbiased because they have their own stakes yeah of course this would work and at the end of the day uh, out of the court this would probably be one of the uh, most powerful tools you would have the association because then yeah uh, Uh, any vendor any customer would be blacklisted and mm-hmm. anyone who would be doing business with them uh, would be you know warned of uh, their previous practices they have a lot of uh, you know bad reputation among business circles so i think that's a good idea that can be implemented okay that sounds like something you can start with now yeah. in when nearing a conclusion so before that how how much would you like to become a mediator Mm-hmm. I think uh, I'd like to benefit from mediation uh, by becoming a mediator <laughs> myself. Uh, so I'm so involved in my business. Maybe uh, it's not uh, such a good idea. But what do you mean but exactly? You, uh, I think that before I can show you the benefits of mediation, mm-hmm. you or someone around you needs to first learn what mediation is. and you should first learn how mediation works before any of it can be seen as a viable product for you because i think you've only seen mediation that have happened in pefma in other areas that you worked on and yeah. you may not be exposed to the sort of mediation that we do also mediation that we train for okay. so i'd like to tell you that in i believe on the 20th of july we're having pakistan's first online mediation course and we are going to use it inshallah all through pakistan to train our mediators in civil and commercial disputes 
they'll be accredited by the CMC from the UK and CME in Singapore. So it is possibly the most qualified course you can do on the planet right now. And I'd like to invite either you or someone from within your organization to do this course so that you can then use or see its benefits within your organization as well. Because if you do, then I would believe that you would be the biggest ambassador of our work anyway. Then. It'd be that simple. You just have to see how it works. Mm -hmm. So we will definitely get back on this soon. But that said, Mr. Omerifik, thank you very much for your time. This has been a very enlightened conversation. Thanks, Akbar. It was an interesting conversation. And looking forward to the 20th, I would like to be a part of the webinar you're doing. And I think I'll learn a lot. So yeah, looking forward to it. Great. Let's do it. Right. See you soon. Goodbye. Yeah.